Okay, so I think, um, first of all, as Paul said, I, I, I'm a research associate in the School of Education here now. I also did my PhD here, finishing in 2022. And I think when I joined, I thought, you know, everyone would be doing research with children. That's what, you know, most people in education were probably all doing that. I was quite kind of surprised to find that, you know, with education being such a broad field, there in fact was quite a, a small number of people uh, who were doing research with children here. And in fact, um, for lots of my own kind of learning around research methods, I ended up looking uh, to things like children's geographies uh, to get lots of uh, support and ideas around children's methods. So I, I hope that uh, the people in this room will be happy to, to hear that uh, this lecture is happening today. And as I say, I'm looking at um, child-friendly research methods and kind of questioning the idea of whether there are any inherently child-friendly methods. And it's a cross-cultural exploration because my own PhD study was in Tanzania. But I think because there's such a big focus on context um, that um, I'm looking across different contexts that whether you're researching with children or adults or whatever context it's in, there should be something for everyone. Okay, so I'll start by just kind of framing my own work and uh, the topic for today and then look a little bit at um, why research with children. I'll give a little bit about the context and the design of the example study. So, so throughout the, the presentation, I'll kind of go back and forth between uh, referring to the wider literature around methods and also giving illustrative examples and kind of practical examples of how it played out in practice in my own, in my own um, doctoral work. I'll look at this question of whether there are any child-friendly methods I'll also look at the value of multiple methods. And I've kind of made a rod for my own back here today by wanting to talk about the benefits of using multiple methods, which obviously means I'm limited in the depth I can go into about any one individual method. But let's see how we get on. Um, I'll touch on some ethical issues, although that could be a session in itself. And then I'll look at uh, three of the main kind of methodological areas in my own study which were activity clubs, drawing on arts-based methods, postal elicitation interviews, and go-alongs. I suspect that go-alongs will, um, not, will not have time to do all three. So I'm, uh, I've left it in the presentation. So if people want information about it later, I can send out the slides. A little bit about analysis and writing up and then some discussion at the end. Okay, so let me start by kind of setting, setting the scene. My own work and the methods I'll be talking about today are part of the kind of qualitative paradigm. And there's obviously lots of different ways of uh, defining and describing qualitative research. But I find this quote from Brown and Clark particularly useful, saying qualitative research is about meaning and meaning making and viewing these as always context bound, positioned and situated. And we'll come back to that thread throughout uh, the lecture today, that idea of it being context bound and familiarity with the context being, being key. Uh, in the title, I also talked about creative uh, research. I just want to touch on that very briefly. Um, but it's only quite recently that I kind of felt I could reclaim calling myself a, a creative researcher because I've managed to detach it from ideas of kind of artistic ability. Uh, I do not see myself as someone who has artistic abilities, but I do see myself as a creative researcher in the ways that, for example, I can respond to and adapt um, traditional methods to meet new contexts or new situations and kind of more interdisciplinary approaches uh, to do kind of creative theoretical or conceptual models. And the picture on the screen there is the, is the physical model that I, I built of my um, conceptualization of space as socially produced to inform my, my thesis. Uh, and finally, in the title, I also talked about a cross-cultural exploration of methods. And my work sits mainly in the field of comparative and international education. Um, the study of my PhD was um, a single country study uh, but within the wider Sustainable Healthy Learning Cities and Neighbourhoods Network, which was a large seven country comparative um, network study. Um, and one of the kind of mantras in comparative and international education is context matters. And again, we've got this thread of if you want to produce knowledge and learn around education, looking across different contexts, then um, 
looking across different countries, then context becomes really foregrounded. With that in mind, I think, especially when researching with, with children, it's really important to think about where our knowledge and understanding of childhoods and child development comes from. And it was in Lancy's work, which uh, I found it really useful, uh, his idea around weird societies, weird standing for Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. And he posits that the majority of kind of authoritative knowledge that we draw on uh, around children, around childhoods and child development comes from these weird societies. But in fact, this is, um, he, he says it's the worst subpopulation one could study for generalizing about homo sapiens. So really highlighting that, you know, the majority of the world's children uh, do not live in these weird societies. The majority of the world's children live in the global south or low and middle income countries, or I, I like uh, Punchy's um, way of talking about the majority world and the minority world. So the majority of the world's children uh, live in the majority world. And yet somehow, as Punch also says, these majority world childhoods are often positioned as a deviant, you know, compared with the kind of um, the, the globalized norm of, of the kind of Western childhood. So I think just having that kind of cross-cultural idea of troubling some of these assumptions that we have around what we know about uh, childhoods, what we know about uh, children's lives is a kind of useful starting point as well. Okay. So the big first question is why research with children? Um, and although we're much better at it now, this is still a neglected area. And, and in, health, in health research, there's the concept of the missing child. Uh, you know, even though there's a big push for uh, you know, more research with children rather than on children, um, it, it still is a kind of neglected area. And this may be because there's still a legacy of these kind of lingering notions that children are not really worth listening to because, you know, they have silly ideas rather than sensible ideas um, and that really they're, they're incomplete adults. And if you want to understand about what children think, then it's better to talk to you know, a sensible adult that knows the child rather than the child themselves. Um, for example, the idea that children are less capable of, kind of abstract thought and so not able to express such complex ideas or not able to communicate so effectively. So there's still maybe some legacy of these traditional notions of, uh, of children and research with children. And one of the big shifts came uh, with the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child back in the 80s and Article 12 of that, which it says that children have the right to participate meaningfully in matters affecting their lives. And that has kind of mobilized or helped mobilize a big kind of children's uh, rights agenda. And there's lots of different ways that that's been operationalized and uh, played out in many different contexts. And, and Paul um, was just telling me the other day about the Scottish government's new infant pledge, which is a kind of um, position from the perspective of the child or the infant child, um, looking at the importance of listening to and understanding um, what matters to children from very young ages in Scotland. Uh, and I can put the link in the slides if we share them later as well. In terms of kind of my own impetus for research with children, and looking at literature and research in the global south, um, there's definitely a sense of about making visible and um, representation of children in the research which is there. Very often children are represented in kind of neutral statistics, for example in gross enrolment ratios, in survival rates between primary and secondary school, in dropout rates and in learning, learning outcomes data. Uh, and also as I was saying before, um, you know, research with children is neglected, but in the majority world, as Punch points out, research which is done with children often focuses on the most marginalized. So for example, um, street children or child sex workers or, um, oh, sorry, I just got a request about recordings. Um, or child soldiers, for example. So the research which is there is maybe more focused on children in very in quite remarkable circumstances, 
which leaves us with this kind of, and although that's obviously very valuable work, it does leave us with a kind of invisible majority where we don't know much about the everyday experience of children, for example, in their schooling. So um, I'll tell you a little bit now about my, my own study, um, which was in Tanzania. And you'll see on the map there, it's in the Northwest area in a town called Bukoba in the region of Kagera. And I had worked previously for several years in teacher education in that area. Um, and so I, I was familiar with the environment already when this opportunity came up um, for a scholarship as part of that sustainable, healthy learning cities and neighborhoods. Uh, project and Tanzania was one of the case studies so it was a really uh, great fit and the topic of my um, doctoral study was perceptions and experiences of urban school home and neighborhood learning spaces and implications for pedagogy in Tanzanian primary schools and it was a comparative case study and yeah, as I said, I kind of I already was familiar with that area. And in fact, I was still in touch with many of my former students and one of whom then became one of the research associates or assistants and interpreters during my study. So I chose a case study design uh, because it kind of foregrounded the importance of context and it was very suited to uh, looking at these complex phenomena and both learning and pedagogy. Uh, can be seen as complex phenomena, education systems themselves as open complex systems uh, demand uh, an approach which kind of is able to hold that complexity. It was a comparative case study based on the work of um, Bartlett and Vavris. And although it was a single study, a single country study, the comparisons uh, took place in multiple directions. For example, between home and school, between teachers and pupils, uh, and between the schools themselves. Uh, I kind of adopted an interdisciplinary approach and applied a kind of spatial lens, kind of drawing on the work of Doreen Massey in human geography uh, in order to kind of look at these different learning spaces and how home, school and neighbourhood spaces were, were produced, how they were socially produced and the implications, implications for learning in those different socially produced spaces. The data generation took place over about five months um, and I used multiple methods. Two high performing urban government primary schools where I selected them as kind of fuzzy hubs of the cases of it um, wasn't just the school itself, which was the unit of analysis, but the school with its neighborhood and with those children's homes around it. And for my participants, I worked closely with 21 pupils aged between nine and 14 eight teachers and then head teachers and local education leaders. And a kind of key part of this as well, uh, my key Swahili and the, the main language in Tanzania uh, was okay at a conversational level, but I knew I would be missing a lot of detail uh, if I relied on that or if I relied on, um, for example, uh, adult participants to use English. So I worked very closely with research associates as interpreters and this became a key part uh, of the process as well in terms of their them as key informants as well as um, interpreters. So in terms of um, why research with children in this study, um, I can, that builds on some of the points from that last slide. Uh, and when talking about learning, one of the things I wanted to do was kind of trouble those discourses around the learning crisis, which is a very common discourse and um, looking at especially education in the Global South at the moment. Uh, and there's a kind of common quote which comes out about, um, you know, millions of children are in school but not learning. So I wanted to trouble that a little bit by looking at um, the fact that learning happens in other places other than school and to get children's perceptions of their own learning in school and out of school. But also, if millions of children are in school but not learning, uh, what are they learning? Is it maybe not what they are supposed to be learning, but they're still learning something? Or what is it like? to be in school and not learning or learning. So to kind of include children's perspectives in that. In addition, I had to focus on pedagogy and a lot of the uh, literature around Tanzanian education focuses on um, characterizing pedagogy as uh, teacher-centered. And in classrooms with one teacher and maybe over a hundred children, this kind of puts the children in this kind of default categorization as being this passive, homogenous 
maths and I wanted to really unpack that and, and look at the children uh, within those classrooms and their experience and perceptions of being in those classrooms. So that's the study. Um, so going back to that original question of whether or not there are any child-friendly methods, so methods which are inherently good for working with children. And I kind of question that based on um, the idea of, of context uh, on how important the context is for, for designing and selecting your methods. But having said that, there definitely are key considerations when you are selecting and designing methods for research with children rather than adults. And I'll just go through um, a few of the key points here. Uh, the first is to do with power and protection. And this looks at children's relative lack of power in society and therefore the, the power dynamics that need to be considered between an adult researcher uh, and child participants. And, and also children's um, kind of vulnerability because of that lack of power um, and therefore the need for particular protections to be in place for researching with children. Uh, the second point would be that uh, children, uh, because of their age, uh, have less experience of the world. Um, and so the, that needs to be considered in the methods which are chosen, but it's still important to note that their experience that they do have will be different from the adults in their lives or the adults when they were children. And so that kind of highlights the importance of, of making the space to listen to the experiences that they, they do have. Uh, the third point is around language and that children might have fewer words or might make up their own words uh, or might not be able to use uh, their words in the same way as adults to express their ideas. And so that kind of highlights the need to think of alternative ways of expressing ideas, alternative ways to, to um, get insight into children's perceptions and experiences. And finally, uh, that the children are not a kind of, oh, so I should say children are not a homogenous group. Uh, there's kind of great variety within children, um, for example, according to age and disability. Um, but that's not to say that research cannot be done with very young children or with children with disabilities. It just means that they, as with any group, there'll be specific considerations that you need to, to have um, for working with those groups. Okay, so let's move on now to, to the main methods focus. And in my study, I use multiple methods with adults and with children. Um, the ones in the green boxes here are the methods I use with children. So for example, setting up activity clubs, using visual arts based and participatory methods, using photo elicitation interviews, which I did with teachers and with pupils, using classroom observations, which obviously gives insight into both the teachers and the pupils, uh, go alongs, which are um, similar to walking interviews and also did interviews with the teachers. So yeah, as I said before, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the activity clubs and the photo elicitation, um, and then we might have to part the go-alongs for another day. But the first thing I wanted to do was basically look at why I selected to focus on multiple methods. And there's a great paper by Derbyshire and colleagues um, called Multiple Methods in Qualitative Research with Children, More Insight or Just More? Um, you're kind of asking with maybe you're just duplicating, uh, you're just doing, um, getting the same data, but in a different way. Um, and they concluded, like I did, that um, it did give more insight, not just more data. So there are a number of reasons why uh, multiple methods were particularly beneficial. Uh, the first is that it's a kind of a core part of case study design anyway, in terms of relying on multiple sources of evidence to, to provide that rich, that rich description. I also found when thinking about how to ensure the quality of qualitative research, um, that having different ways to generate that data was really, was really useful. And Tracy looks at rich rigor and credibility as being kind of criteria for the quality of qualitative research and finding, yeah, finding different sources um, and ways of doing that to strengthen the quality of the study. 
for my own study as well, different methods provide different um, ways to access those different spaces. So for example, the methods which you could do to understand um, learning in school spaces would be quite different from in home spaces. And also in terms of the children themselves, um, I wanted to find different ways to engage them, which would hopefully lead to kind of more you know, full contribution, active participation on their behalf, and, and having the flexibility built in to see what they would respond well to, what were they interested in, uh, was a key part of having multiple methods. And finally, going back to those considerations around um, research with children and, and power disparities, I wanted to look at different ways which could position children as kind of experts or co-producers as much as possible, trying to kind of mitigate against some of those adult-child uh, relationships which exist. Now, this should be a full, at least hour in itself on ethics, uh, but we're just going to kind of rattle through this. Um, I found it particularly useful to think of ethics as kind of three intersecting layers in this study. On the one layer, we have our kind of procedural ethics, which is the, the process that you go through uh, to be in line with the institutional protocols. And it's incredibly useful because it really supports you to think through everything that you're going to do in detail. So it really is valuable kind of preparation. Um, however, as Bradley says, ethics should not be reduced to the act of filling in the form. And really that the hard work starts, the hard ethical work starts in practice and that second area of ethics in practice. And this really is the kind of day-to-day decision-making around ethics, which are, are thrown up at you all the time. Uh, and areas of informed consent kind of straddle this procedural and ethics and practice idea. Um, there's a great quote on the right saying, a signature is proof of the exchange of objects among people who do not trust each other. And that comes from uh, research into uh, the impact that informed consent processes have on the quality of data generated in, in research in Africa, basically saying that in many African countries, you sign something if you don't trust the person you're working with. So in terms of building rapport with participants, for example, that, that can be a kind of massive barrier to building those um, more participatory uh, relationships that you want in, in this kind of research. And I definitely found that in this study, that those formal processes had to be kind of separated out from the main research activities. Otherwise, they, they just... Um, they, they damage the rapport and the trust that you were building up. So I find different ways of doing that. And similarly with the, with the children, this uh, process of assent. So not just that the parents were giving consent for the children, but the children um, were giving their own assent. And for example, in the activity clubs, we spent a lot of time in those first meetings uh, talking about what we we're doing, why we we're doing it, having question and answers so that they knew and could ask what they were involved in. And then throughout the five months, um, regularly kind of checking back in on that with the options to withdraw and to shape um, the research as we went along. And that final layer is around kind of the local ethos, which is more related with the kind of values and beliefs um, that, that, um, that communities live by. And this is something, for example, ideas around reciprocity when I was filling in that institutional ethics form and saying you know, that in order to thank the participants for their time, I will um, give them some English lessons and I will give them these resources. But in fact, uh, the participants' ideas of reciprocity were very different to that. And it was much more linked with, well, we are in each other's lives now. Uh, we have a relationship now. And so we will just continue to, to give and take with each other. Um, and will not cut ties when the research is over, as you might have been recommended to do in your institutional ethics. We're, we're going to be friends for life now. So ideas around reciprocity and community were very different according to that kind of local ethos. Okay, so finally into the first of the main methods I'd like to talk about. And this is not really a method in itself, uh, because I wanted to create these, these club spaces where groups of children in each of the case study schools could come together to explore different topics in different ways 
um, and extracurricular clubs are already common in Tanzania. So it was a kind of good way of doing that. But within these clubs, I was drawing on uh, visual methods, arts-based methods, participatory approaches, but also kind of focus group methods, looking at um, consensus building and sharing ideas and discussion. So just to draw on a few of these, um, as we saw before, participatory approaches uh, are particularly useful for letting children express ideas in their own terms, for mitigating some of the language uh, issues which might be there, and for reducing some of those power disparities. And there's a whole breadth of literature around each of these areas. I'm just really touching a little bit here. Uh, linked with those alternatives to writing and speaking is the idea of is the, the concept of arts-based methods. Um, and the arts is enabling other ways of seeing, knowing, and expressing the world. And I like Kahneman and Taylor's, Kahneman Taylor's quote about stretching capacities for creativity and knowing. So using the arts um, or tapping into the arts as a, as a way of looking at other ways of, of seeing the world. Now, each of these art forms, for example, photography, drama, poetry, drawing, they all have their own kind of literature surrounding them. Uh, and each of them offers a very distinctive uh, contribution. And as I said before, you know, I wasn't going into this as a as a kind of um, as an arts practitioner, but more as a way of opening up opportunities of different ways and different tools for children to express their ideas. But one key thing I would add to this, in terms of the arts, uh, the arts-based approaches, is a consideration of um, what counts as your data. I know that also, you know. Arts can be used as dissemination and communication of, um, kind of knowledge and learning as well. But in terms of what counts as the data, I found it really useful to think about whether or not it, it's the, the process of creating the art form, which is your, your data, or whether it's that product. Is it the art form itself, which you're going to analyze and see as your data? And these two papers here were really um, gave you really useful contrasts. And um, the first with Ansel and colleagues work with young people in Southern Africa, where they were um, map doing life maps and different diagrams and drawings, and then presenting and sharing their ideas. And very much the process of those drawings uh, was what the researchers were interested in. That was, what, that was where they saw the, the kind of knowledge generation happening. Whereas in Logie's paper, the children were drawing um, their conceptions of learning in the classroom, but the end, the drawings themselves were what she used for, for the analysis. So it's just quite useful to, to think about when using these, these different art forms, what which part of it uh, is actually constituting the data. And a kind of final thing to flag up here as well is, is about not romanticizing these methods um, and arts based not necessarily not being seen as a kind of panacea. Um, you know, automatically people will be able to express ideas more freely or more creatively through these art forms. And that, in fact, they can be anxiety provoking or even disempowering. And I'm thinking of a, a colleague at the moment who's doing ethnographic work in secondary schools, who the teacher said to them, please don't make us draw pictures. Please just talk to us and ask questions. Um, you know, so to not to think that uh, and again, context, context really matters. And those two papers um, really flagged up that point as well. The, the young adults, young people in the Southern African study found drawing to be a very accuracy focused, silent individual, um, you know, really related it with kind of school learning. Um, whereas the children in the Lodge um, study, which was in England, we're obviously much more familiar with being asked to express their ideas through through drawing. And so um, they both responded to very similar tasks in very different ways. Again, context is everything. So how did this play out in my own study? Um, so I, I set up activity clubs in both the schools, uh, one of them with eight pupils and one of them with 13. In one, it was like an after school club and in the other, it was like a holiday club. And um, during the club's sessions, uh, we've kind of built around four themes. So there was themes around my daily routine, uh, my ideal school, um, my neighborhoods, and my learning. 
And each of those tasks or, or each of those themes had a kind of key task linked with it. Uh, for example, miming, drawing, mapping, and then mini surveys and analysis. Because of my kind of past experience in Tanzania and my time that I'd spent in primary classrooms there, I took a very flexible and, and calling it a scaffolded approach. Um, and linking back to that Ansel paper on the last slide, I, I knew that for primary children in Tanzania, drawing is very often something which is done for copying maybe technical or scientific diagrams into their into their exercise books. It's not necessarily uh, a kind of creative, expressive way of communicating their ideas. And so if I wanted children to draw pictures, which I did, because I still wanted to be able to um, give kind of new experiences or, or new ways of expressing ideas for them, then I wanted to scaffold that. So for example, over several club sessions, we might play some drawing games where they had to draw things quickly, like in a Pictionary game. And we did those kind of activities building up to the main kind of data task, which was drawing their ideal school and then having a gallery and sharing their ideas around their ideal school. Um, so yes, that was the kind of scaffolded approach I took. And then a really key part of the process was that after each club session, we would have a kind of full debrief uh, with the research associate because, um, again, with language issues, but also just with so many activities going on, that became a really key source of data as well um, to have that kind of time to talk over, not just what the children had done, but how they'd done it, how they responded to the tasks, that became another source of data. So in terms of the possibilities and opportunities, it really kind of brought a lot of very rich, rich insight through these multiple interactions, the children interacting with each other, with the resources, with the tasks, with the research associate and with me. And throughout that, we kind of created a new learning space, which I hadn't really anticipated at the start of the study, that even though this was in a school classroom, um, New, new rules applied because we kind of created this new social learning space. Also the activity clubs were the first main um, thing that we did with the children. And so it really was key in kind of building up that trust and rapport, which really helped with the go-alongs and the photo elicitation, which were more kind of one-to-one -one activities later. And in terms of, um, kind of limitations and tensions, I come back to that idea around um, you know, what methods people might respond to in what ways. And in fact, probably the surveys, the kind of peer surveys and peer analysis that these children did in their age between nine and 14, was probably one of the richest sources of, of kind of data and insight in, the, in those clubs, more so than the drawings. Uh, for example, in the drawings, although the discussions around them was very generative, um, there was a lot of, uh, can I borrow your ruler, please? And should it be to, you know, should it, the perspective be from bird's eye for the math? You're very accuracy focused with a very big sense of um, making a mark on a page means taking a risk because you're opening yourself up to be mocked and teased by your peers. So there was lots of kind of um, laughing at each other's drawings if they weren't good enough. Uh, and in fact, you know, it, it obviously was an enjoyable process in terms of the access to the resources and um, having a new task to do, uh, but it was also quite at times stressful for some of the children, I think. And one of the other limitations maybe was around, the same as in a lot of focus group discussions, how to kind of capture all the kind of rich discussion which was going on at the time. Okay, so, Let's move on now to the photo elicitation uh, interviews. Um, and this is often uh, photo elicitation and photo voice are both kind of commonly used in participatory uh, research designs. Um, photo elicitation uh, is where the photograph themselves becomes a stimulus for talk. So the participants uh, use cameras to take the photographs and then those photographs are used in an interview later. And one of the advantages is that participants are able to kind of steer the data generation process and often um, kind of guides or prompts are given, but it's up to the participants to, to decide what they want to take pictures of. So it really does help with those power disparities, but also uh, kind of position them as experts in their own lives 
kind of really steering that process. It also is really valuable for getting access to spaces that um, the researcher uh, maybe can't access so easily, or that it might be quite intrusive for the researcher to be in that space. So in terms of gaining access and insight into children's home learning, photo elicitation is really valuable here. And I also, it can help bridge that communication and conceptual and language differences. But something else to flag up here, um, when you're presented with a photograph, you, you kind of can't help thinking, oh, but that, that's what it really is. That's what it really looks like. Um, but Dockett and colleagues flag up that, you know, photographs are no nearer to the truth or to children's reality than any other kind of data. Uh, there was still a selection process and choosing what to take, when to take it, what to talk about, whether to talk about it. Um, so yeah, not to kind of get caught up in the idea that it's somehow showing a greater reality. And so what did it look like in my study? Uh, well, in fact, this photograph is one of my favorite from, from my, whole, um, my whole study. I don't know how they managed to catch all those drops of water. I, I just love it. Um, that was taken by Emmanuel, who was 11 years old. I was in standard five. And he took this picture because he wanted to show something that he'd learned to do at home and that he could do well. Uh, so he told me about how his mum had taught him how to wash clothes and how now it's a kind of normal part of his, his routine. So this method's probably the one which um, required the kind of most kind of planning, preparation and kind of ongoing uh, checking. Um, and in that preparation process, it went right from the kind of initial kind of camera choice. Uh, so for example, one of the reasons this started later in the data generation process is because I really wanted to take time to observe, you know, who was using cameras out and about in the town in Bukoba. Basically, no one was. No one was taking pictures of anything. Uh, there weren't people taking selfies. Basically, people were not taking photographs often at all. Um, there was a very strong uh, feeling that children should not have mobile phones and that mobile phones were, were bad for children uh, from talking to teachers and parents and neighbours. Um, and so those, those kind of observations and that kind of local ethos and ethics and practice kind of all built into the decision to use kind of small digital cameras rather than cameras on phones, for example. Um, and you know that I couldn't use disposable cameras because there wasn't any local um, film processing places anymore. Uh, so that meant when we had a kind of orientation session, there needed to be part technical and part ethical sections to that orientation. So with a small group of children, we would have kind of technical uh, practice of how to take a picture, how to save, how to view, how to delete. Um, and then we also had sessions uh, where we looked at how to use the camera ethically. So for example, the pupils drew up their own list of rules for using the camera. They were really excited by this. Um, and their rules generally were things about don't get the camera wet, keep the camera away from chickens and cats. You know, they were very kind of um, focused on the safety of the equipment. But with some prompting and guidance, uh, we also kind of um, came up with rules like uh, the final ones we agreed were, don't take a picture that will make someone feel bad and ask permission if you want to take a picture of a person or their environment. So we kind of worked together to come up with these kind of ethical guidelines uh, for children as well. Uh, the children, there was also risks around um, children carrying what could be what could be a kind of valuable piece of equipment uh, in terms of putting them at risk um, of, of it being stolen and not worried about the camera, worried about the children. Um, and so for that reason, children were taking the camera home just maybe overnight or for a weekend, for example, phone calls to the parents so that they knew that they, they were coming, for example. Um, and then after they took the photographs, I'd upload them to the laptop and we'd sit there and the child would um, work through on the laptop showing um, what they had taken and why. So those were the main questions. Tell me about what you took a picture of and why. And the children were responding to prompts around things like um, something that you, uh, something you like learning, something you recently learned, something you like doing, for example something you find difficult. So they had different prompts they could choose from for their photos. And another key part was um, 
focusing on absence as well as presence. So for example, asking, were there any pictures that you wanted to take that you weren't able to? And that was a kind of important thing to add because people, for example, one pupil had wanted to take a picture of the teacher in the classroom to show something that really helped them learn. Uh, but they knew they weren't supposed to have the camera in school or to take pictures of people. Uh, so asking questions around absence was also really important. This was probably the most valuable uh, of, the, of the methods that I used. Uh, it was really exciting and engaging and rewarding for the children themselves. Like they were very excited that they had learned new skills and, and I think also felt that they were really able to, to contribute to the study. Um, it really minimized the kind of intrusion in terms of a foreigner being in their home learning spaces. So it kind of did that as well. And it had really great links to the other data methods. Um, I mentioned a little bit before in the local ethos, and so there was definitely um, questions around you know, the children using equipment um, was a consideration, and the time, unfortunately, the children only had the cameras for a limited amount of time at home, and it would have been much better if they'd been able to use it over a longer period. I just wanted to draw on that links to the other methods as well, and look a little bit at some of the other photographs which the children produced and, and why they were so valuable. Um, and as I said, this was particularly valuable for insight into the out of school learning spaces. And these are some of the photographs that the, that the children took. And one of the key themes which came out from the thesis overall was around um, children's um, shared sense of shared responsibility, uh, and which came out a lot through their, through their work and the things they'd learned to do, which were kind of work related. And uh, so, for example, um, on the left there, we've got pictures of a kind of uh, of the, the home environment. And they talked about the importance of keeping your environment clean. Um, this then they could link with this one child link with, with really complex other aspects of learning linked with cutting grass in order to get rid of mosquitoes, to reduce the risk of malaria, uh, talking about uh, the importance of having a good environment to help your neighbours, to help the neighbourhood look good. And um, they talked about the importance of working on your shamba, your home farm, both in, or, in terms of um, producing food for your family, but also in terms of your shared responsibility and that you shouldn't expect just to be able to eat without contributing to, uh, to even grow the food, for example. Uh, and in terms of things like cooking, that bottom left picture, young children talk about how they learn to cook but also linking in with ideas about the difference between learning at home and school. One girl saying that when you make a mistake at home, you don't get beaten. And this linked in with um, a, a big theme which came from the in-school research as well around um, children's responses to corporal punishment and the effect that that had on their learning. So we can see there that the kind of um, contrast between home learning and school learning as well. And the, the um, the microscope photo is another really good contrast there where this girl was talking about um, going to see her neighbor who was a pharmacist who she could ask all the questions she wanted to do about medicine. She wanted to be a doctor when she grew up. Uh, and this was stood in stark contrast to the classroom observations and the, the kind of roles that children had to take in the, in the classroom in terms of their learning, which was much more around uh, short nuggets of factual knowledge and memorization, rather than this kind of really engaged, taking initiative, driving questions about things you're interested in. Paul, I think I'm probably running out of time, am I? So as suspected... Yeah, just a couple of minutes left, really. We oh, that's get... fine. Yeah, no, that's fine. I'll just skip really to, to recap then, to saying that... Um, that there aren't necessarily any inherently child-friendly methods, but there definitely are uh, key considerations for doing research with children. And just to reiterate as well that um, the benefits of multiple methods in terms of researching complex phenomena.